All right, class. Well, welcome back to part C of this lecture. So in the first part, we discussed the eccentricity vector, which is a non-physical uh, invariant of the motion. And we use that to derive the polar equation, uh, which is actually the proof that uh, Newton's first law of motion is satisfied. That is, the orbit sweeps out an ellipse uh, with respect to the central body, where the central body lies at one of the foci of that ellipse. Um, we then uh, talked about conversions between the physical invariants, specifically angular momentum and energy. Angular momentum giving you the semi-lattice rectum and the energy giving you the semi-major axis. And we talked about how you can use those two numbers to get eccentricity as well. So now, uh, here I'll just give a uh, demonstration of the elliptic motion and another thing that we talked about at the end of last lecture, which was the uh, exchange between uh, potential energy and kinetic energy as the uh, planet or spacecraft moves about its orbit. And here we actually see uh, three orbits. Uh, the outer one is approximately circular. Uh, the inner one is highly elliptic. These are about the sun, it looks like. And uh, this one is slightly elliptic. So in this, uh, in this motion, what you can see is, A, it's an ellipse. Okay, we can see that. But you can also see, that, especially in this elliptic case, the planet slowing down and speeding up as it gets farther away from the central body and as it returns to the central body. That's because each of these orbits, each of these lines, uh, denotes a line of constant energy. Now, of course, in these outer orbits, most of the energy is always in the form of potential energy. In the inner orbit, however, which is overall less energetic, although clearly moving faster, and that's another thing we saw in the end of lecture two, or part B, lecture three, uh, you see this exchange happening between kinetic and potential energy. So out here, there's quite a bit of potential energy because so, you're so far from the gravity well. And as you move in, all that potential energy is lost. So at this point, you have almost no potential energy. And it's all in the form of kinetic energy. Again, an illustration of that exchange between kinetic and potential energy. Uh, what do I have this? Well, because I want to do all three of Kepler's laws here at the end in part C. Uh, but of course, we actually proved uh, Kepler's first law really in part A. So, you know, this is a little bit of a repeat and giving you something extra. All right. So not much more we can say at this point about Kepler's uh, first law because we proved it quite a bit, quite a long time ago. And so let's move on now for, to Kepler's second law, which is a little bit more complicated, although not so complicated as we'll see. Um, specifically, uh, Kepler's second law gives us some notion of time, uh, how the orbit moves as a function of time, which is important, right? Because you want to be able to make predictions uh, of where a planet's position is going to be in the future. Remember that Kepler's whole purpose was to create large predictive tables to determine uh, when is a good time to mount your Russia campaign, uh, for example, uh, at the conjunction of Mars and Mercury or Jupiter and Saturn or something or other. I don't know when these conjunctions actually occur. But anyway, you'd like to predict when they occur so you can plan your, your, your nation state wars accordingly. Of course, no one did that very well. It never is a good time to invade Russia, uh, as we all know. Uh, actually, we could just say the winter is a bad time to invade Russia. In any case, uh, here we've got uh, the uh, substitute for uh, predictive power in the form of time. Um, so here, let's just put that on repeat. So what we have here is essentially a metronome. This illustration is a metronome where it's ticking on and off at constant intervals as a, so this is this amount of time is the same as this amount of time is the same as this amount of time is the same as this amount of time. Now you can see in this uh, illustration that the rate of change of angle is certainly not constant, right? The, this amount of time has, this delta T has a much larger angle than this delta T. So delta F, this is remember true anomaly, 
Delta F over delta T is clearly not constant, although there's some debate about whether Newton thought it was when he was a, he was a young student, um, having maybe perhaps misread uh, translations or transliterations, I guess, of Kepler's work. In any case, uh, so that the rate of change of angle clearly not constant. So we can't really say anything actually about f dot at this point. Uh, likewise, the arc subtended here also clearly not constant. So what is constant about these uh, these little gray and blue la uh, sh uh, shaded regions? Well. Uh, the area, right? The amount of space in two dimensions, at least, which has been shaded. Uh, so you can sort of see that, right? Uh, and we'll make great use of triangles later on, right? If this is our delta t, here's a triangle and its base times its height. Remember, the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So if you multiply this length by this length, then that's approximately equal to multiplying, say, uh, this length times the arc, it subtends, right? So that you could think of that as a base. Uh, well, actually, you would think about this as the hypotenuse. That arc would be the hypotenuse. Here, there, it's approximately the same. Base times height. So that product is approximately constant, but not the uh, uh, the arc length itself, or this height, or the or this base, or this height, or anything else, really. Um, so. Keep these triangles in mind, or pseudo-triangles in mind, as we uh, go to the next step and formally prove this rate of sweep of area being constant. So, yeah, so now it's, I make, make a little dad joke here. Uh, my, my daughter is always giving me a hard time for making dad jokes. Uh, so here's a, here's a particularly egregious one. Uh, time for, we have to, factor time into the equation. We'll do this much more, we'll, we'll talk about time much more in lecture four, uh, but you can think of, of course, um, Kepler's second law as a proxy for time, area being a uh, sort of a, a time-keeping device, if you will. Um, all right, so, and I think I've said everything here. All right, so how are we gonna do this? Um, well, I gave some hints, right? Triangles and areas, right? So that's going to be what we're going to look at. Uh, so we're going to, what we're looking for is dA dt, right? And in particular, we're going to take this in the limit, right? As ta dt goes to, to zero and figure out, right? What is the change of area over change in time when the amount of change in time is infinitesimally small? Right. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's look at an arbitrary point in the orbit. Um, now, to get the intuition behind this, this sort of proof is actually relatively easy. Uh, so if we look at, uh, say, a triangle at uh, periapse, for example, life becomes much easier. So if we look at a triangle here, right, and we look at R, right, and we look at this height, of the not angular momentum, I, I should mention that's height, not angular momentum, uh, then the area of this triangle, dA, is dA is one half base times height, so one time one half times r times h. Right? <clears throat> so uh, if we take the derivative of that, dA dt, right, then that's equal to one half now, our dot is not changing at this point because all our velocity is in the tangential direction, so one half r, but h is changing, and we can write that as h dot. And so actually, h dot, right, is just our velocity, and so we can rewrite h dot as v. And so actually, our rate of change of, uh, of area at this periapse is one half r times v, and uh, Interestingly enough, what is r times v, right? If this is our arm and this is our velocity, r times v is, of course, just angular momentum, which inconveniently is also named h. Uh, I should really not be using h, but I really have a creativity block here, so I can't think of a better letter. Uh, I guess we call it z, okay? 
then sure, why not? Anyway, so uh, v is z dot, right? So then just at this particular point, at least, uh, at the periaps, we see that uh, the rate of sweep of areas uh, are times v, which is, of course, one half of the angular momentum. The angular momentum, of course, being constant. And so we can see just sort of on this uh, heuristic basics given here that the rate of chain uh, of area, the rate of sweep of area is going to be constant because it's one half of the angular momentum and the angular momentum is constant. Anyway, that's uh, just a hand wavy way of doing this. We'll do go through it formally, uh, uh, of course, not just in this hand wavy manner. So, but you can see how Kepler, or, or at least, I don't know if it was Kepler, uh, Kepler maybe got the intuition behind this, right? This, uh, this idea. Um, so let's, let's prove it formally. Let's take a, an arbitrary uh, triangle. Or should I draw the triangle on this side or should we all draw, I'll draw it on this side. Draw my triangle there. Right, there's my triangle. Uh, it's got, this is triangle, it's uh, length, hypotenuse is R. It's uh, this, well, we're gonna look at that in a second, what that is. And uh, so we want to compute its area, dA, for some arbitrary point. Well, the area of that triangle is of course, uh, one half base times height. So let's call, uh, let's see, what should we call our base? Let's call our base uh, R. Uh, and they put a one half there. There's our base. And what's our height? Um, well, let's make this like an equal triangle here. Do it like that. Uh, so in that, that case, our uh, R is uh, our, the hypotenuse of our little triangle. And we'll put a make that a right triangle right there. And in that case, uh, the uh, height is uh, two times uh, R of two. So it's... Uh, sine r, uh, times r, right? So r sine r, or sorry, r sine f. Right. So triangle, the, uh, or delta f, I should say. Right. This angle right here, right? This little tiny angle right here, I should use a smaller point pen, maybe even smaller than that. A little uh, tiny rate of change of angle is uh, delta F there. So um, triangle angle is delta F. Hypotenuse is R or how, whichever triangle you're, you want to make. Uh, and so the uh, that little height there is R sine delta F. So we combine those two terms together and we get one half R squared sine delta F. And of course, uh, now if F is expressed in radians at least, and we hope it is, uh, then sine delta f, if delta is infinitesimally small, is approximately equal to, of course, just delta f. Yeah. So it's approximately equal to 1 half r squared delta f. So delta a is of 1 half r squared delta f. Now let's divide uh, by delta t on both sides. Delta t, I'm using partials here for some reason, I'm not sure why. Uh, and so we get the expression that the rate of change of area is one half r squared, instantaneous rate of change of area, because r of course is also a function of t. Let's suppress that for now, uh, times f dot. So a dot is one half r squared f dot. Okay, so we have now an infinitesimal, or we have an expression uh, differential or differential expression for the rate of sweep of area as a function of time. And now our next step is of course to prove that this is constant. All right, and how are we going to do that? Well, we're gonna show that this term is actually just equal to the angular momentum, which is actually relatively easy to show. How do we show that? Well, I say it's easy to show, but we should do it formally, so let's do that. Uh, let's get rid of these triangles here because they're in my way now. Also, I'll go back to a slightly thicker pen. Here we go. 
so how are we going to do this? So we, the, basically, we're going to calculate the angular momentum vector. Uh, you may say, whoa, hold on, we're back in vector form. Well, OK, yes, sorry about that. But it's going to be the easy vector uh, because we're going to use a specially designed coordinate system known as a satellite normal coordinate system, uh, where the coordinates, as opposed to perifocal, where the coordinates are attached to the eccentricity vector, uh, here in, per in satellite normal coordinate systems, the x-axis is pointing in the direction of the position vector. All right, so in the position vector direction. So aligned with the position vector. Uh, that's the satellite, that's the x. And then the normal part is the y direction is just normal to the uh, position vector. Note that it's not in the velocity direction. So that's a slightly different coordinate system. We'll get into coordinate systems in more depth later. But just well, we're, we're choosing a very simple coordinate system. And why are we choosing such a, a simple coordinate system? It's because it's easy to calculate angular momentum in this coordinate system. So specifically, ba just by definition of our coordinate system, the position vector is just r0, 0. zero. Right, because by definition, the x direction is aligned with the position vector. And then the velocity vector, well, OK, that's a little bit uh, trickier. So here's our velocity vector right here, um, from courtesy of Prussian and Conway. And uh, here we've got um, two components of that velocity vector. The first is, of course, the component in the radial direction. So that's in the x position. And of course, that's r dot, right? right. The rate of change of uh, radius, right? So r dot, clear. And now, of course, the uh, velocity perpendicular to the uh, x direction, the y direction, uh, as we derived over here, right, is our f dot, right? So instantaneously, the velocity being swept in this direction is uh, the length of this arm times the rate of change of this angle, f dot. So we have a, um, a, a component perpendicular, and we have a component in the uh, x direction. So let's just write down our f dot there. And then we'll put a 0 here, because there's no, no out of plane motion, obviously. Uh, and so now we can uh, take the cross product between these two, r cross v. And uh, we've, uh, in our very simple coordinate system, it's obvious, right? what this, uh, this, this number is, right? Well, first of all, it's uh, 0, 0 here, um, it, because right, it's out of the plane. And then the magnitude is, right, if we just write down a, um, our cross products, r dot, r, f dot, 0, i, j, k, right? Uh, in the k direction, it's this term minus this term, but this term is just 0, so it's r times r f dot, so r squared f dot. And that, of course, is our angular momentum vector. And we know that this is our angular momentum vector is constant. And so we have that this particular third part of it, 0 is obviously constant by itself. You don't have to worry about that. This particular part of it, r squared f dot, is also constant and is, in fact, equal to the angular momentum instantaneously at any point in the orbit. You can make that a function of t, right? Because f dot and r squared will both change with time, but their product will not, right? So there we go. Uh, <clears throat> so now we've got, uh, we have that expression for a dot, which is uh, 1 half r squared f dot. And we just proved that this term here is equal to the angular momentum. Uh, and so we have that the rate of sweep of area is equal to the angular momentum divided by 2, which is a constant. And here I'll just box that equals a dot. Which, of course, we argued at the very beginning of this slide that this is going to be true. But now we've proven it slightly more rigorously. Yeah. So 
establishes Kepler's second law that equal areas are swept out in equal times regardless of where you are on the orbit. So a very nice result there. All right. So now uh, we get to Kepler's third law. So Kepler's third law, <laughs> there's actually mul multiple ways of proving this. Uh, Kepler's third law. And I'm going to go over the uh, the way Kepler probably proved it. Um, which again, very hard to predict the where a planet is going to be at any given time because neither f dot is constant, it's not constant, or this distance, right, is not constant. Uh, maybe call this the arc. However, there is one point in the orbit which we can predict with absolute certainty. And that is uh, where the orbit will be after one entire period has passed. Right? So why is that? Uh, because at, in, after the one entire period has passed, right, our delta t is one period, right, the period of the orbit, and our delta a is the area of the ellipse. Right. So, right, if delta A over delta T is constant, right, equals H over 2, right, well, then we can say the area that's equal to the area of the ellipse over the period of the orbit. So it makes it very easy because we, we know what the area of an ellipse is. It's similar to a circle, pi r squared, right, for a circle. Uh, but in fact, for an ellipse, it's pi a b. So in an ellipse, remember, the semi a is the semi-major axis, and b is the semi-minor axis. B, this is one of the very few times when we actually use b. Uh, fortunately, there's an expression for the semi-minor minor axis in terms of the uh, eccentricity and, and semi-major axis, so we can we can eliminate B real quick just by using that. Okay. So right, we just take this uh, uh, this differential equation here, or proto-differential equation, because of course Kepler had no notion of differential equations at this point, um, and uh, integrate it over one period, right? And so when we do that, we get actually we're going to reverse these equalities. And have dt equals 2 over h uh, dA, right? And we integrate that over one period, and we get that e that's equal to the period equals 2 over h times the area of the ellipse, right? Just this expression right here. Now we can uh, play some various plug-in games. Uh, so specifically, the area ellipse is pi AB. To pi a b, and on the bottom we have the angular momentum vector, or sorry, angular momentum constant. Um, so let's play a plug-in game with angular momentum. If we remember, angular momentum uh, h squared over two is the semi-lattice rectum, which is a one minus e squared, and so we can find an expression for h as equal to square root of 2a1 minus e squared. So we'll play that plug-in game on the bottom. Uh, where is that plug-in game? Uh, sorry, um, so h squared over mu, right? My bad, not 2, mu. It rhymes with mu. I don't know why I said 2. Uh, h squared over mu, right? Uh, so plug that in right here, and we get the square root of mu a, one minus e squared on the bottom. And now uh, pi a b, b is of course a one minus e squared on the top. So we plug that into the top as well. We get this expression right here. Now we can play a cancellation game. Uh, so we have a square root of one minus e squared on the bottom and a square root of one minus e squared on the top. So that cancels that. Um, let's see what else have we got here to play with. We've got a, 
on the bottom, which is of course, uh, we can pull that out, it's a one half on the bottom. So that one half is gonna cancel a one half up here. And so that's we can do minus one half right there. Scratch that out. And uh, so we get, uh, well, here on the top, we get a to the three halves, which is two minus one half. And of course, what is a to the three halves? It's the square root of a cubed. So this two pi just comes down there. The square root of mu stays right there. And this a to the three halves becomes this term right here. So we have now uh, the expression for the period of the orbit is a two pi times the square root of a cubed over mu. If we now square that whole expression, right, then we get um, that just be, the square root disappears, this becomes squared, this becomes squared. Now we uh, just uh, drop the, that cube over to the bottom here, and uh, we've, what we're left off with is um, four pi squared over mu equals t squared over a cubed, which uh, is, because this is constant, a uh, gravitational constant, which of course wouldn't have been known to Kepler, but it tells you that the uh, cube of the semi-major axis is proportional to the square of the period, basically. Uh, t squared equals four pi squared over mu times the cube of the semi-major axis. Right. So, of course, uh, what this tells us is that um, it's A, the Kepler's third law, uh, is a simple um, consequence of Kepler's second law because we're just integrating Kepler's second law for one period. So, really natural consequence. Um, so, that's one way of deriving it. Another thing we can say is that if you can observe both the uh, distance, right, the semi-major axis of the orbit, and you can observe its period, period is a little bit easier to observe than the semi-major axis, but if you can observe both those numbers, you can figure out the gravitational constant of the planet. So if you can observe A and P, T, the distance and the period, that will give you uh, mu. So makes it a, a generally a, just a, an easy way to figure out the gravitational constant of the planet is just to measure its period and its semi-major axis. Right. So um, here I've got another little video here, which is kind of cute. So I like to play it, uh, which shows that uh, the eccentricity of the orbit doesn't factor in. So that's another thing to note from the Kepler's third law is the eccentricity nowhere appears in this orbit, in, in this expression for uh, the period. So here's, for example, all a uh, bunch of planets, all with the sem same semi-major axis, but all with different eccentricities. And you can see that they're all sort of synced up. I mean, more or less synced up, because I guess this one was started a little bit wrong. But in any case, right, no matter what the eccentricity, the semi-major axis alone determines the... Uh, uh, the period of the orbit. So this length of this, uh, the, from periapse to apoapse, determines. So even though, right, uh, this, uh, this orbit, say for example, actually has a quite a bit farther to go, it looks like, than this orbit, um, they actually accomplish the same thing in the same amount of period because this, this satellite over here spends a great deal of time hovering here doing nothing and letting everyone catch up to it. So it's, this is like the the hare and this is the tortoise, slow and steady, and the hare is like, yeah, I'm fast, but then like, oh no, I'm like tired, so I'm gonna take a nap. Right. And then everyone catches up and they have a tie. So interesting little uh, doodle there. Uh, another thing to say about Kepler's third law is that it's actually, okay, so there's two ways of thinking about this. So in, in one way, Kepler's third law is a natural consequence of uh, universal gravitation. Uh, the other way of thinking about it is universal gravitation perhaps was inspired or is a natural consequence of Kepler's third law. Um, so to see that, you have to think about orbits in a slightly different way, which I hinted at earlier. 
which is that an orbit is, remember, represents the balance of forces. It represents the balance of the gravitational force and the centripetal force, centripetal acceleration, really, because centripetal force, there's no such thing, typically. Right? Gravity is the centripetal force. It's producing the centripetal acceleration. Right. In any case, right, in order to move in a circle, right, circular motion uh, requires an acceleration, a uh, constant acceleration of omega squared r. You may remember that where this is the uh, uh, angular velocity um, of, the, uh, of the, this, this rotation. So it's rotating with, uh, with speed, angular speed omega. Measured, of course, in radians, but okay, let's ignore that. So uh, to maintain this circular motion, you need an acceleration uh, omega squared r. And what is the force provided by gravity? Well, it must be the force needed to maintain that acceleration, right? Force due to gravity. Uh, so let's. So this gives us actually a way of calculating. Uh, that uh, force due to gravity, or at least the form of that force due to gravity. Right. So let's uh, so let's propose, for example, that the force due to gravity is uh, mu over r squared, which of course it is. Uh, that's that's Newton's universal gravitational law. And so uh, what we do is we set these two equal to each other, right? And omega squared r, which is angular acceler which is centripetal acceleration, and acceleration due to gravity being equal, uh, mu over r squared. Right? And then, well, we've got to move into the into period because, of course, Kepler was working with periods. And so, the what is the angular velocity of a um, uh, of a circle? Right? It's just the you sweep out 2 pi radians in one period, and so the angular velocity is 2 pi over period. And so we just plug that into the formula for angular acceleration, and we get uh, this uh, square here. Uh, 2 pi squared is 4 pi squared divided by t squared uh, times r equals mu over r, r squared. And then we can uh, just solve here for, uh, for t and r. Right, move, say this these r squareds up there. It becomes cubed. Move this four pi down here, four pi squared down there, and we get uh, this expression here. And then we can uh, invert that to obtain Kepler's third law. Right, just swap the numerator and denominator, and we get the same form for uh, at least for circular motion. We get Kepler's third law follows immediately from um, uh, from uh, 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 Newton's law of universal gravitation. Remember, for circular orbits, uh, r equals a for circular orbits. So, again, right, we could reverse these steps to obtain, uh, I mean, we, we didn't know what this, this mu here was, but we could have, Newton could have reversed these, and I'm not sure he did, but maybe it, it sounds reasonable if he's going to fit Kepler's third law to the data. Uh, that uh, where else would he get the 1 over r squared term, right? It's very easy to reverse these steps and de deduce that your law of gravity it has to be proportional to 1 over r squared, right? So probably uh, Kep uh, Newton obtained his law of universal gravitation by taking Kepler's third law and uh, reversing these steps to obtain an expression for gravity, which had to vary as 1 over r squared, probably. Anyway, so that's, uh, so that's Kepler's third law, right? Now, let's apply it to, um, briefly, uh, one particular uh, problem, which uh, is very, uh, one particular orbit, one particular application, which is very uh, commonly used which is the problem of uh, geosynchronous, or actually, in our case, we're going to use geostationary, but actually, uh, the analysis here applies just to geosynchronous. So the difference between... Uh, geo, sorry, let me explain what geosynchronous is, right? So you may have noticed, uh, I think we've made the case now, that the Earth rotates about its axis, right? Uh, and its period, the, the, the period of the Earth is 
uh, approximately one day. Actually, the, uh, the period of the Earth is actually 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. And that's because uh, it actually uh, doesn't rotate quite 365 times a year. It uh, rotates 364.25 times a year because, of course, just if it wasn't rotating at all, move, motion about the sun right, would give you one rotation per year. Right? So it actually rotates uh, 364.25 days a year. Anyway. Uh, so the period of the Earth is 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. Right. So if you have a communication satellite or you have a direct TV satellite or whatever kind of satellite you want that is servicing a particular part of the Earth, say you want to uh, service, uh, I don't know what that country is, uh, Bolivia, who knows. In any case, uh, if you want to service a particular side of the Earth, right? you want to design your satellite to communicate only with North and America, South America, for example, uh, it's a, satellites naturally orbit the Earth. And so if you don't time your period of the orbit quite right, uh, your satellite is going to move, cover the entire Earth. It's going to rotate around the surface of the Earth. However, if you time your, the period of the orbit just right, you can get it so that it seems to hover right above a particular point on the Earth. And those are called, well, actually, if it's exactly the same point on the Earth, it's uh, geostationary. If, it, if you allow it to go up and down uh, above the equator, then it's geosynchronous. So here's a couple GIFs of uh, geosynchronous. So here's, uh, these are both from Wikipedia, by the way. Uh, here's your point on the Earth, and the Earth is rotating, and your, the period of the Earth is matched by the period of the geosynchronous satellite. Another uh, image here, right? Uh, you see the Earth rotating, and you see the satellite seeming to hover above that point on the Earth, right? It almost looks like, you know, there's a, a it almost looks like there's a cable here attached to the Earth, and you're spinning your satellite around just like through centripetal acceleration, which is actually something I'll talk about in a second. Uh, with space elevators. Right. But anyway, we're not talking about space elevators, we're talking about geosynchronous satellites. Anyway, as you might imagine, the, this is a very popular orbit for, say, communication uh, satellites and television satellites and stuff like that. And so uh, it's worth spending a little bit of extra time thinking about this one. So specifically, we have a circular orbit, right? We don't want it to speed up and slow down, obviously. And what should be the radius or the height or the altitude of that geosynchronous orbit? Uh, so specifically, we got our uh, period. So from the rotation, the Earth rotates uh, 360, sorry, 363, I meant, no. Uh, the, there's 365 days in the year. I think that should be four. All right. um, so uh, if you take, get get the, period from that, right? Um, so, right, uh, if you uh, determine your, your period based on the number of times it rotates a year, right? Um, so one, uh, rota one, ro one, one delta t per period, uh, then, and we then convert it to seconds, we find that the desired period of this orbit is 86,164 uh, seconds. So interestingly enough, if you uh, count to 86,164 using Mississippi's, uh, then uh, that will take you one day, interestingly enough. It doesn't seem like it should take you a day, but it does. In any case, uh, we converted it to seconds, of course, because uh, that's the units that we're going to use. Uh, specifically, they have to match the units of this gravitational constant, and so that's what we're using. So the, gra the gravitational constant, its units are seconds and kilometers, just FYI. Uh, so now we can plug this into Kepler's third law and uh, solve for A to obtain an expression for A in terms of period. And we plug in this number now for the period. And we ex obtain an expression doing this division and cube rooting. And we get an A of 42,146 kilometers. So that is the distance from the note, the center of the Earth up to the satellite, which is essentially being slung around uh, the Earth 
by a, a chord, which is defined by gravity. It's an invisible chord. It's called gravity. Right. Notice, however, uh, that it's a slight, you may see a different number in the literature, and that's because the distance from the surface of the Earth to this satellite is, uh, is this radius divided, or this distance divided by the radius of the Earth, which is 6378. And that gives you uh, like 38,000 something or 36,000 blah, 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 blah kilometers. So that's the radius of the Earth. Right. Um, okay. So that's a uh, uh, relatively straightforward calculation. A very popular orbit, of course. Uh, it's a popular orbit because, of course, uh, you have communication satellites which are designed uh, or funded for a particular market. Uh, so if you say design a communication satellite or a direct TV satellite for the for America, for example, uh, you don't want that satellite spending much time over, say, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. That's a not popular spot. However, as we see, right, this particular orbit is so popular, it's uh, and it has to be precisely that radius, so there's no wiggle room there, uh, that the geostationary slots have gotten relatively uh, crowded. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, there are treaties about the geostationary satellites, um, space treaties, limiting the number of geostationary satellites which are allowed up there. And so there's actually, it's been slotted. There are 1,800 geostationary satellites, uh, slots, right, not satellites. Um, however, there are, of course, slots which are more popular than others. So one's over the middle of the Pacific Ocean, less popular than, say, the ones over North, and North America and South America, by, because, of course, North and South America are like up here and down there, so they share the same slot. Uh, and the one for, say, Europe and uh, the Middle East. Uh, no, actually, the Middle East is a little bit farther east. Uh, so Middle East and Russia, or Europe and uh, in North Africa, or, or you, know, you get the idea, right? So there are certain areas of the Earth which are more popular than others, and you can sort of see them here on the distribution of current uh, geosynchronous satellites. Actually, I think this is relatively old. This is from the uh, National Air and Space Museum. Uh, so this, uh, this is over here is uh, Europe and the Middle East. And this, uh, this area over here is uh, North and South America, or at least the most popular parts of North and South America. So, for example, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where I'm am right now, is 112 degrees west, so that's about here. Right, so there's Phoenix, Arizona. So you can see here, like the East Coast is uh, gets a little bit more coverage than the uh, the West Coast. Anyway, as you imagine, as you can imagine, these uh, geosynchronous slots are uh, very popular. At present, uh, their availability is still first come, first serve. You claim one and you get it. It's yours forever. It's a homestead app. Uh, so if you put your satellite up there, you get that slot. And actually, even if uh, that satellite dies at some point and you bother to deorbit, which you, you're required to do, uh, or at least move it out of that slot, then you can replace it. It's yours forever, as long as you keep, sort of maintain that. Right. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, there's like, uh, there's some question about uh, whether this is the best system to assign geosynchronous satellite slots. Uh, first come, first serve, bit of gold rush mentality. But uh, we'll see, right, when we run out of slots, uh, what, uh, what, what happens. Um, we'll find out, I guess. In any case, I think I mentioned uh, space elevators at some point. So this seems like a logical uh, time to actually define what, what, what this is. So if you remember, uh, here's your geosynchronous satellite. It seems like, right, there's this like tether. It seems like it's tethered above one particular point on the Earth, right? So now let's imagine that you're, you have a really big geosynchronous stable satellite with a really big spool of, uh, let's call it um, cable or thread or something like that. Well, if you try to start to unspool that cable, right, the cable is going to come down like that, right. Um, now let's say the, uh, the, the cable is um, infinitely light. So if you let down enough cable, 
it'll eventually right attack, hit drop down to the point directly below your satellite right so that's kind of cool I mean if you let it out slowly so it doesn't accelerate and things like that but let's ignore that point uh, so you could actually just in theory if you have infinitely light cable just drop it down from your satellite and uh, and attach it to the earth now of course uh, cables are not infinitely light and so the idea is uh, well the idea is to create an infinitely light cable and then that's a tether from earth to geosynchronous and then you just have like a little elevator attached to that cable and that uh, uses like electricity or something to uh, climb up the cable to the geosynchronous satellite now, of course, uh, there's some forces here, right? Because your cable can't be infinitely light, so it has some gravitational force. And uh, the uh, climber may have some gravitational force as well. So that's going to tend to pull your, um, your geosynchronous satellite out of orbit. So how do you counter that? Well, uh, we have, this is, this is a matter of uh, centripetal acceleration, right? Versus gravity. At this point, right, centripetal acceleration omega squared r is precisely equal to the force due to gravity, which is mu over r squared. Right? At points lower than that, the force due to gravity will be greater than omega squared r, meaning you'll tend to fall out of that orbit. Right? And at points above geosynchronous, omega squared r will be the centripetal acceleration will tend to be greater than gravity. Right. So the goal then, right, is to uh, to counter these uh, these forces, right, due to the weight of the cable and the climber, by putting a little bit of weight above the geosynchronous orbit, so that this the omega squared r produced by this centripetal acceleration here counters the force due to gravity uh, right here, right, at these parts of the tether. Okay. Anyway, so that's the idea. Again, brings in the concepts of geosynchronous orbit, brings in the concepts of centripetal acceleration versus gravity. Uh, very nice concept. Um, and in fact, actually, uh, if, you, if you build such a thing, right, uh, notice that at no point in this, on this tether, other than gravity, uh, at the geosynchronous point, is your velocity actually equal to uh, that of a circular orbit, right? Remember the uh, circular orbit is omega over r, velocity of a circular orbit. Uh, and no point, right, on this orbit is that equal to uh, a circular orbit at that point, except at the geosync. And so if you got to a point like way up here, for example, actually your velocity is omega r, right, which is greater than that of a circular orbit. And so if actually you release things at the top of a space elevator, uh, they have a lot of energy in excess of what you need for a circular orbit. And in fact, if you build a space elevator long enough, uh, you can simply release a payload and that omega r term, uh, this is the rotation rate of the Earth and this is the distance to the top, uh, is actually enough to get you outside the uh, gravity well of the Earth. Right? Um, and so there's various things you can do with that and have all sorts of fun launching spacecraft to Mars or Jupiter just based on free release trajectories. Anyway, I have a paper on that. That's why I feel like talking about it. Anyway, I better finish up here. Uh, and I'll finish up with uh, a slight discussion of things which are unique to parabolae and hyperbolae. So this is only fair because I talked about thing, uh, something which was unique to ellipses which was the period and the apoapse. Uh, these things don't exist for parabolae and hyperbolae. And so it, it makes sense that I would define something, one or two things, just for equality, uh, which are unique to the hyperbolae and parabolae. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about turning angles. Before I get on to turning angles, however, I'll uh, make a quick mention of uh, <laughs> back to the Greeks, back from lecture one, uh, which is conic sections. Uh, so the, there's a nice interpretation of ellipses, parabolae, and hyperbolae, uh, and circles, of course, which uh, involves uh, 
in the intersection of a, a fundamental cone with a plane. So in particular, you can prove that all of these, um, these, uh, these paths, these orbits, are special cases of a, uh, this fundamental cone intersected uh, with a plane. So if the plane is uh, horizontal, you have a circular orbit. If the plane is inclined at a angle which is slightly less than uh, this, uh, the slope of this uh, fundamental cone, then you have an ellipse. If the plane is inclined at exactly equal to the slope of the fundamental cone, you get a parabola. And if the um, uh, cone or the plane is inclined at an angle uh, greater than the slope of the fundamental cone, then you get a hyperbola. So for example, actually, uh, this is also a hyperbola. That would be a slope. So these are, this is a hyperbola. Uh, this is interesting because um, the the property, this property, the intersection, uh, the showing that circles and ellipses and hyperbolae are all sort of uh, the the same mathematical construction was actually very old, and we can date this back uh, to the Greeks as well. Uh, first, uh, we can date it. Well, it has been attrib attributed to uh, a Greek whose name I cannot pronounce. Um, Menekmus, I'm going to just guess, right? Menekmus, uh, who didn't, uh, the, the ten connection to Menekmus is kind of tenuous. However, I uh, preferred attributing it, and in fact, it was very rigorously described and uh, documented by our good old friend Apollonius of Perga, who you may remember, remember was the first, also the guy who uh, first invented epi epicycles and deference. Remember, those are the uh, technology which was then uh, absconded by Ptolemy in his Amalgamus, and uh, then he added the equin Sydney centrics. Uh, however, you can also note that generally it's considered that Apollonius also invented equin Sydney centrics, or uh, yes, equins and eccentrics, uh, and in fact actually was able to prove that the effect of the equins and eccentrics was equivalent to that of the epicycles in deference. So, interestingly enough, right? It all, I, I like this story because, uh, because it clearly illustrates that uh, while circles were known to Apollonius, so were ellipses and parabolae and hyperbolae. So I think perhaps it's one of the great missed opportunities of uh, the development of astronomy that Apollonius didn't recognize that the ellipse was perhaps a better tool for fitting to orbits than circles uh, alone. Uh, circles alone also defining epicycles and deference. I, I, that might be a misspelling of deference, actually. In any case, uh, missed opportunity brings us back to Apollonius of Perga. In any case, uh, these uh, the parabola and hyperbole are, of course, special cases of the polar equation, which of course was not known to Apollonius of Perga. And so we're going to go back to this uh, polar equation one last time to define one additional quantity uh, for uh, uh, which is relevant to hyperbolae and parabolae, but not to elliptic orbits. And that is the turning angle. Uh, spe specifically, turning angle, uh, so in a hyperbolic or parabolic orbit, your orbit is coming in, in from this direction, comes in, makes its point of periapse, which is of course, right, uh, p over one plus e. Again, that formula holds for hyperbolae and ellipses, and turns right from this incoming angle to this outgoing angle by an amount uh, delta. Right, that's your turning angle. Now for ellipses, this uh, will show that this turning angle is 180 degrees. And for hyperbolae, the turning angle is less than 180 degrees. So specifically, how will we uh, determine that? Well, it's actually relatively easy to calculate turning angle as a function of eccentricity. So this will be the last sort of uh, geometric thing that we're going to discuss, this turning angle. 
so specifically, let's uh, consider the case of hyperbole. Uh, so the goal then is to calculate, essentially, the true anomaly at which we are at infinity in both the incoming and outcoming trajectories. So when, the, when, is, uh, when is the true anomaly resulting in an infinite radius? So at r equals infinity, and also r equals infinity over here. Well, there's only two times that r is equal to infinity for a fix for an f, any given f, and that's when the denominator is equal to zero. So we can just block off this and make it p. And so the incoming and outcoming trajectories, this angle and this angle, correspond to the cases when the denominator is zero. One plus e cosine f is zero. And so it's relatively easy to determine what those angles are, right? Uh, because we can just solve this equation for zero, uh, for f. Right, one plus e cosine f is zero. We just solve for f and we find that uh, the two values of f for which that occurs are plus or minus inverse cosine of one over e. All right, so specifically the negative angle, right? So this is positive angle from periaps. This is a negative angle. The negative angle corresponds to the incoming asymptote, right? This angle. And the plus version corresponds to the outgoing asymptote. And so now we can figure out the angle between the incoming and outcoming as outgoing asymptotes by figuring out what this angle right here is. So basically, we take those two angles, this angle plus this angle, and we subtract off 180 degrees to get uh, the turning angle. So let me see if I can draw that a little bit better. Uh, maybe use a different color here. So, right, there's one angle, there's two angles. So this is, right, uh, so both of these, let's call them uh, cos inverse cosine f. Let's call that um, f, right? f uh, prime, maybe f1, or f, 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 f turning angle, right? Call this f turning angle. And so the total angle, right, from here to here is 2f turning angle, right? And so the now, angle here, right, this turning angle, delta, is uh, 2 times that total turning angle minus 180 degrees. Yeah. So uh, we're going to actually add a, a multiple of 360 and make it plus, but so we're going to add plus 360 to this. And so we get 180, because we can add multiples of 360 and nothing changes. Uh, plus 2ft. Right. So, or actually in this case, we're going to do minus ft. So, uh, that's the uh, expression for turning angle, right? 180 degrees minus 2ft, uh, and ft is inverse cosine of 1 over e. So, we, our expression for turning angle can be reduced to, uh, now using another geometric expression, 2 times the inverse sine of 1 over e. So an expression for the turning angle in terms solely of eccentricity. Again, a doesn't matter here. So again, one of those quantities which doesn't depend, which depends on one of the, uh, the orbital elements but not the other one. Right. Notice how, in addition, right, that uh, the, uh, the polar equation actually uh, corresponds both of these trajectory, what happens after you leave this, uh, this, this what, what happens when you get an f greater than this, this extreme value, when r becomes greater than infinity, actually the polar equation predicts that you come back on the other side and then depart again and come back on this side. So these, this, uh, this point matches this point and this point matches this point. You swap around, come back on the other side. This, of course, is an entirely fictional orbit because you never achieve r equals infinity. So this, uh, the, the polar equation actually predicts what's called a vacant orbit or a, hypo a theoretical orbit or whatever you want to call it, 
Uh, but anyway, uh, it predicts that, but of course, there, this is not actually a real solution. There's, you don't, satellites or comets don't actually come back on the other side of the universe and bump you in the buck. Uh, in any case, uh, we can uh, extend this to uh, parabolae as well, but of course, in this case, the, uh, that limiting value of f occurs exactly at plus or minus pi, and so the, or 180 degrees, and so the turning angle for a parabolic orbit is exactly equal to plus or minus, to equal 180 degrees. So a, in a parabolic or, orbit, you're coming in in one direction and you're leaving exactly opposite to the way you came. Um, all, everything else is the same uh, for elliptic orbits as the, all the other formulas are the same. There's some, you know, some interesting relationships uh, in the special case of parabolic orbits. Uh, in particular, uh, it's, it's quite interesting to note, although I don't know what it means, uh, that the semi-lattice rectum, if you just plug in for um, uh, zero, for cosine equals zero, uh, the angle, the, the distance of periapsis is uh, precisely the semi-lattice rectum divided by two, right? So that's interesting. I'm not sure what it means. So that uh, this is RP equals Q, and then the semi-lattice rectum is two RP. So again, interesting, I'm not quite sure what it means, but that's, that's an interesting fact. Also, of course, a parabolic orbit uh, has no excess velocity. Uh, total energy is equal to zero. Again, we're gonna come back and talk about hyperbolic orbits and uh, in parabolic, or well, not really parabolic orbits. We'll come back and talk about hyperbolic orbits after we've talked about the Kepler equation in time, because there's an equivalent version for predicting the motion of hyperbolic orbits. But again, that's going to have to wait to, I think, lecture five or six or something like that. In any case, we'll now conclude uh, lecture three. I'll just uh, give some nice equations here, which you'll find useful for doing the homework and so on and so forth. Uh, but I won't talk about them here in the video. So you can look at those online uh, and see, use them for reference, put them on your equation sheet for the exam or, or whatever you'd like to do with them. So at this point, I'll close up uh, this rather substantive lecture. And next time, we'll come back to talking about predictive power of uh, the orbit and finding out where you're going to be at any given moment in the future. All right, I'll see you then.